This lecture is on the Holy Spirit. We're starting with pneumatology, and we're going to start out with uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. But as we start in pneumatology, um, we are going to look at our confessions of faith. Of course, we have the Seminary's Confession of Faith and the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. From the Articles of Religious Faith, which again is the Statement of Faith for the Seminary, the Holy Spirit is a person who has been sent from God to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, to regenerate and cleanse from sin, and to teach, guide, and strengthen strengthen and perfect the believer. So you can see that the statement of faith from the seminary is fairly succinct. It's not, uh, it's not a huge statement. The Baptist Faith and Message is a little bit larger. <clears throat> under number or letter C, uh, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired holy men of old to write the scriptures. Through illumination, he enables men to understand truth. He exalts Christ. He convicts men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He calls men to be to the Savior and effects regeneration. At the moment of regeneration, he baptizes every believer into the body of Christ. He cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, and bestows the spiritual gifts by which they serve God through his church. He seals the believer unto the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. And then we have the scripture references for the Baptist faith and message. So we've got a number of things going on with the person of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're going to examine that. First of all, we're going to look at the fact that the Spirit is a person and not just a force or a power. Um, when you look up the, uh, the Holy Spirit in the Westminster Dictionary, you will find the following definition. The third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, constitute the eternal Godhead. When the Spirit inspired biblical writers, or the Spirit inspired, inspired biblical writers, makes known the saving work of Jesus Christ and is God as present in and with the church. The Spirit acts to incorporate all things into the life of the triune God. We're going to use a couple of different passages as we go through looking at the Spirit, but John 14 through 16 are primarily where we're starting. So, and this is going to examine his person, uh, his coming, and deity. Now, pneumatology and Christology are naturally related, both in person and in work. So, when you study Christology, we would look at who Jesus is, we looked at his divinity, and we looked at his work. And when we study pneumatology, we're also going to look at who the Spirit is, his work, and his divinity. One one other little aspect, though, is sometimes because the, the because Jesus, we have the Gospels, and Jesus is obviously a person. It's not always as clear with the Spirit, however. So we have to spend a little bit of time talking about the fact that the Spirit is actually a person and not <clears throat> merely a force. And so we see that we have that bullet point there. And uh, the Spirit, in his primary designation by Christ as another encourager or comforter of the same type as was the Lord Jesus. So there's a very close affiliation by Jesus himself that the Spirit is going to come along and be another like him. Um, first of all, personality of the Holy Spirit, and this is, or the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Um, we'll talk about the Spirit as the paraclete, or comforter, or advocate. In uh, John 14, 16 through 26, we see parakletos. Um, para means alongside, kaleo is to call out, uh, or to help. So then the Spirit is another who pleads, intercedes, or helps another. So we can certainly see that aspect of the Spirit comforting, helping, um, and being with us. Jesus calls him another helper. He uses alos, uh, another of the same kind, rather than heteros, which would be another of a different kind. So there's, again, close connections between Jesus and the Spirit. <clears throat> he continues the ministry of Christ, 
to the disciples, and especially as they enter, uh, encounter persecution. Um, in 14, John 14, 25 to 27, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your, to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, Jesus' ministry is continued through the Holy Spirit. He is able to, con- to uh, teach, the- continue to teach them, to help them, uh, his- Jesus' disciples, when Jesus is not present physically to them. He is the request of the Son. Uh, from 14, John 14, 13 through 14, and, chapter, and 16, and the gift of the Father from John 14, 16. And, of course, John 14, 16, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So, the Spirit is requested by the Son and the gift of the Father. He's commissioned to be the, uh, the abiding presence of God, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because he neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you, and will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. John fourteen seventeen through 18. So, <clears throat> we are close to God because of the work of the Spirit. He is not uh, just with us, but he is also said to be in us. For he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit was living with the disciples inasmuch as Jesus was present with them. However, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is in his disciples in the same way that the temple in Jerusalem housed the presence of the living God. So the Spirit is housed in the believer's body. So uh, that's important, too, because Jesus was with his disciples physically. He was there beside them. And that's one kind of relationship you can have. But in this relationship with the Spirit, we are indwelt by the Spirit so he is with us, he is present to us, yes, but he is also closer than anyone else could be to us in a kind of, uh, in, in a sense. So he is not one that can be separated from us. His presence to us is always going to be there. As we know the Father and the Son, so we can also know the Spirit. And so we're told, but you know him. So the Spirit is not just something that is unknowable, uh, or that who is unknowable, rather. He is able to be known. And, and I, if you notice, just a sentence or two ago, I slipped in to some un, some language that we can easily do when we are talking about the Spirit. We can often refer to the Spirit as it and, um, and refer to it more as a power rather than a person. So we've got to be careful. And even, even I, who am very aware of this, can, you can slip into that just because the word Spirit is not typically thought of as a person in English. So it's, it's something that we have to be vigilant about. The Spirit as pedagogue, okay? And so that's teacher. Jesus, is prom- Jesus promises that the Spirit will complete his teaching and reinforce what has been taught. And we're familiar with um, the, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So <clears throat> there's a teaching aspect as well to the work of the uh, Spirit. John 14, um, continuing here, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me, taking from what is mine and making it known to you. <clears throat> so we see that uh, the Spirit is continuing to teach, and he is not teaching something new. He is not teaching something that's contrary to what Jesus has taught. He is continuing to take and, and to do what Jesus had started and what Jesus was working on. Uh, he is commissioned as the Spirit of Truth, um, literally the spirit of the truth. The significance of this is that the spirit comes not merely to communicate the truth in abstract, but to replace Christ himself who is the truth. The third person of the Trinity carries out Christ's presence on earth as his proxy. In other words, he stands in for Christ. And looking at that uh, reference here, 
But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So in a real sense, the spirit replaces or stands in for Christ in this teaching role, <clears throat> continuing what Jesus had taught. <clears throat> now, it's important for us to remember that continuing to teach what Jesus has taught is not to provide something that is going to be contrary to what Jesus taught. So we have to be very careful to understand that the Spirit is going to reinforce, is going to remind, and to bring back to memory the things that Jesus taught. But it's not going to be providing something that is contrary to what Jesus taught. The Spirit is a person. Uh, we're looking again in John chapters 15 and 16. <clears throat> Um, a spirit is a person, even as Christ is a person. And uh, there's some unusual grammar that's used by Jesus in uh, the Greek in John here. Now, the Greek word pneuma is a neuter gender word. So it should call for a neuter pronoun. So the Greek language, if you haven't had it, like many languages, is a gendered language. You have certain constructions that are masculine, certain constructions that are feminine, and with Greek you actually have a non, uh, a neutered, which is neither masculine nor feminine. So, if you are using pneuma, you would call the word using pneuma, that would call for the neutered pronoun, because the pronouns would agree with the noun in, in their case in gender. However, this rule is deliberately, it says contradicted here, but it's deliberately used differently. So in John 15, 26, the spirit of truth, he will testify about me. It would call for a pronoun that would be more of it, the spirit of truth, it will testify me. But instead of using the neutered pronoun, they use the masculine pronoun. So that's evidence then of personhood and that there's an intent. Um, continue in John 16, 13 through 14. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me. So there's that's intentional there in that verse that we are to see that pronoun doesn't fit with the word pneuma. It would call for the neutered pronoun, but it's giving the masculine pronoun. And that's more evidence of uh, a person in, rather than a force or something that is not personal. John 16, 7 through 8, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world. Again, we're seeing this pattern. <clears throat> so when we see the pattern of using the gendered pronoun instead of the neutered pronoun, this deliberate contradicting or this deliberate avoidance of this rule or misapplication here, then we know there's a reason for that. And so that is uh, some of our evidence that Jesus and John, who's writing this down, understood that the person of the Spirit, uh, that the Spirit was a person. So, now the work of the Spirit parallels the work of Christ. He comes to replace Christ, to carry on his work, and only to, main, and to maintain the, the Lord's presence with the believer. Only a person could do that. So, not only do you have the idea of the, the pronoun, which is significant, you have the idea that the Spirit's work is the type of work that persons do. It's not, it's not something that could be fulfilled by uh, a mere force. So we have that there. The Spirit is certainly a person, and he is, of course, if he's going to teach, then that also requires uh, him to be a person. And um, so if he's going to comfort, that also re re requires him to be a person. So we've got a number of different ways that we can come about this and support the idea that the Spirit is 
personal. He is a person. He is not just a an entity. Okay. Now, let's, uh, all right. Um, but the Spirit also is a procession. John 15, 6, 26 through 27. This debate um, divides the Eastern and Western Church, um, and it's known as uh, the Philoque controversy. Now, this is, in some ways, we say this. We say this debate split the church, but in some ways, it was just the last straw. There were other factors uh, that were very important there, but this is the the controversy that really bears the brunt, at least publicly, of why the split. But it's it's really more nuanced than that. You can't simply say, well, if it hadn't been for this. Uh, the church wouldn't have split. Well, probably if it hadn't been for this, it would have been something else. But uh, this is the, the kind of the theological basis. They really had had enough of each other and didn't like what the other was doing. This led to the uh, the great schism. And uh, uh, when the counselor comes, John 15, 26 through 27, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So, here we see that Jesus is sending with the Father, or he's requesting of the Father. He says, I will send to you from the Father. Jesus is, is requesting, and he is sending the, the Spirit. So, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and he proceeds from the Son. And that's the that's the issue with the filioque uh, controversy. That that phrase means and the Son. So the Spirit either proceeds, as the Eastern Church understands, from the Father and not from the Son, just as the the Son proceeds from the Father, or the the Spirit proceeds, as the Western Church understands it from the Father and the Son. Now, we come out of a Western church tradition, so we have this understanding implicit in our own theological traditions. So, again, John 16, 7, Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So there seems to be the idea that Jesus is going to be tied up in sending the Spirit. Um, some more passages we can say, see here, he proceeds from the Father and the Son in Acts, Romans, and Galatians. You can look those up. He's identified in the Scripture in his Trinitarian relationships primarily in terms of his function or mission rather than his essence. So we could see um, that. Scripture is focusing on the function of the Spirit more so than an ontology of the Spirit. Uh, in, in Scripture, and he comes with the full authority of God. So the Spirit is then proceeding from the Father and the Son, and we understand the Eastern Church takes exception to that, and that's one uh, that is an area of controversy. Now, why is that important? Well, there actually are a few reasons why this you may want to consider and think about uh, this position. If the Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, then you would expect that the Spirit, while the Spirit can have an, a universal mission, it can work, the Spirit, He can work worldwide, you would expect that there's a definite connection to the church because the Father has sent the Son and the Father and the Son have together sent the Spirit. So you would expect the Spirit to be working primarily through the church and directing and guiding toward the church. However, if the Spirit is sent by the Father alone, then the Father has sent Jesus, has sent the Son, and he has sent the Spirit. Now, it's possible, then, that the Spirit could work apart from the church. And I don't mean simply that the Spirit wouldn't be free to work anywhere in the world, but that the Spirit might work in such a way that is not directed towards the church because the Spirit would not be sent by the Son as well. And this is, as some will argue, something that could lead toward a type of universalism, where you will see, well, the, the Spirit is working in the places where the church is not working, 
and they're both sent by the Father, and so you know salvation may be able to come through the church, and then also come through the Spirit outside of the church. And so that can be an issue there that uh, could arise if you accept the idea that the Spirit does not proceed from the Father and the Son, but only from the Father. So just uh, food for thought there. The Spirit as presence, um, 16, John 16, 7 through 11, uh, he convicts the, the world that's part of his, his ministry. His convicting ministry characterizes the Holy Spirit's relationship to the world. Now, this text is deliberately ambiguous, and the word for convict is complicated. The word means to cross-examine for the purpose of convicting or refuting an opponent. Um, generally in legal settings, or to rebuke, shame, or expose. For the believer, the Spirit is an advocate, but to the unbelieving world, he is a prosecuting attorney. Um, and we have John 16, 7 through 11, but I tell you the truth, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So, the Spirit convicts, and uh, let's look at the different ways that the Spirit convicts. Well, first, he convicts of sin, or in other words, humans, the humanity problem, or human's problem, man's problem. The Spirit's ministry is again parallel to that of Christ. Failure to believe God is the basis of sin, and failure to believe in Christ is the ultimate sin, Okay, because men do not believe in me. The Spirit convicts of sin because... Without this conviction, we would not believe. Conviction is a gracious work. It's not an emotion, but an awareness of one's true standing before God. So, again, we have Acts 2.37 here. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So, conviction is not just guilt, feeling guilty, but it's an awareness of your actual situation, of the reality of the situation. The convicting work of the Spirit is accomplished in all who hear the gospel, not just the elect. This would indicate that grace in some way is not irresistible. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So that certainly can be used as, uh, if, if you so choose, as evidence that the Spirit can be resisted. And um, so it may challenge the idea of an irresistible grace. He convicts of righteousness, which is God's provision. He reveals what righteousness is. Again, the Spirit's ministry parallels the ministry of Christ because Jesus is no longer here. The Holy Spirit creates this awareness. The correct relation to the true nature of God's righteousness is despair. Luke 5.8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. So we uh, we think that often we, we kind of, whoa, if we saw God who he really is, that would be uh, just so inspiring and uplifting, but really it would fill us with dread because of our own awareness of our condition. So we need to, to remember that. Um, he reveals where righteousness can be found. Spurgeon points out that in human courts, the prosecutor moves directly from conviction to judgment. By contrast, the divine prosecutor uses an intermediate phase in which the righteousness of faith is presented. So, once we realize that we are guilty, then the Spirit offers us the opportunity for faith. And the Spirit, as uh, convicting of judgment... This, the, that is the unbeliever's punishment. God's judgment comes eventually and, e and inevitably. And um, by judging Jesus by uh, or by by the the cross, we see that God's wrath is is severe and significant. And um, Satan's judgment there is proof of this ultimate judgment that is to come for those who are not in Christ. It's severe, it's important, 
this judgment came and was was the wrath was poured out on Jesus, and Satan's judgment is proof of that inevitableness of God's judgment that's coming. All right, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to look at some of the purposes of why the Spirit came, and uh, continuing. You know, using John's gospel, the Spirit comes to universalize the local ministry of Jesus. The Spirit is at all places at all times. And um, this is very important for us to remember. Jesus was physically embodied. So he was walking around. When he was walking around in Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem. He wasn't outside of the city. He wasn't in North America or in Asia or anywhere like that. So he was temporally, spatially located as, G, as the incarnate Christ in the Holy Land. Now, that means that if there were disciples on one side of the city and disciples on the other side of the city, Jesus could have been with one group but not with the other at the same time. Well, think about the church today. We say, well, wouldn't it be great if Jesus was still with us? Sure, it would be. However, Jesus would only be able to be in one place at a time. The Spirit is able to universalize this local ministry of Jesus. So we have Christians all around the world. And the Spirit is present to those Christians all the time. So one of the tremendous benefits of the Spirit's coming, and consequently Jesus' is leaving, is that that local ministry of Jesus now is present all throughout the world. Imagine if today we wanted to be in God's presence, but we had to go to Jerusalem, or we or we had to follow Jesus if he went on tour somewhere. Okay, that would not work out for us the way that it is now. It's much better that Jesus has sent the Spirit because all Christians are able to be indwelt by the Spirit. All Christians are indwelt by the Spirit, but. Because of that, wherever we are in the world, we're able to be present to God. And uh, that would not have been the case if Jesus had remained physically and had not sent the Spirit. So uh, that's important for us to remember. Jesus was sent by the Father. The Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son. So um, the, uh, the, as Jesus is the truth, so the Spirit is the truth and will lead into all truth. So those are, are good things. Jesus still had much to teach his disciples, the uh, Spirit continues teaching Jesus' is what, he, what he taught, what he was teaching them. The role is not giving new revelation, but to bear witness to what Jesus had done. Uh, going to the first bullet at the top, Jesus glorified the Father rather than himself, so the Spirit glorifies Christ rather than himself. And then the world did not, finally at the bottom, the world did not accept Jesus, neither will it accept the Spirit. So there's some things about the Holy Spirit here that we can uh, infer from the passage, from the, the gospel generally. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the tri triune God. The primary doctrine, of course, is the Trinity. Uh, he is the third person of the Godhead. The distinctions are not of power, but of progression and revelation. So um, when we are talking about the Spirit, we realize he is a member of the Trinity, and so he has all of the same attributes of God because he is he is a member of the Trinity. And um, one of the problems that you can have when you stress the differences between the Trinity, if you take an ontological approach and you stress the ontological aspect of way alone, then you will say very clearly, you can say very clearly, we have a single God who simply does some different things. And this gets us into modalism, where we have God that acts as God the Father, who acts as the Son, who acts as the Spirit. And that, of course, is problematic. That's not Trinitarian Christianity. That is modalism. So, if you stress the ontological aspect, the essence of the Trinity too much, you could end up with modalism. If you, the function, functional approach, however, you could end up with uh, tritheism. Okay, if you stress that 
too much. And if you say, well, you know, the, this is the work that this father does, and the father doesn't do the son's work, and the son doesn't do the spirit's work. If you push those distinctions too hard, you can end up with having three different gods. So that would be tritheism, which is also not Trinitarian Christianity. So you have to understand there are distinctions uh, between the members of the Godhead, but it's not of essence, and it is something of function, but you can't uh, push those too hard, and you need to focus on the unity of the Godhead. The correct correlation is the unity of the Godhead. There are three persons, equal in divine perfections and executing distinct but harmonious offices in the great work of redemption. So, certainly you have to make it a point to see that each member of the, the Godhead is divine, is not diminished, though they have different things that they do, different roles that they accomplish. Uh, we have some examples of all three together at Christ's baptism. Uh, Matthew 3, 16 and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came immediately up from the water. Uh, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see the Father, Son, and the Spirit there in the Great Commission. Uh, we also see Father, Son, and Spirit. Go therefore to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see the Trinity <clears throat> there as well. We also see it in Paul's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In Second Corinthians and in the doctrine of election. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Trinity is being uh, pointed out there um, as well. Um, <clears throat> Reiterating the personhood of the spirit, um, he has intelligence, he has emotions, he has a will, and so you can see the references, John, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians. He is called by endearing names, he has relationships, his power is distinct from his personality, and so uh, we have a couple of uh, scriptures here. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So we see some distinctions here. <clears throat> so again, reiteration, reiterating the, the personhood of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's deity. Um, we see the Holy Spirit identified with the divine name in Acts and 1 Corinthians. In Acts here we see Peter said, Ananias why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. So, very close association there. Um, also, continuing with the Spirit's deity, uh, we see if the Spirit is divine because of his works, not just that he's identified that way, but the works that he has shown to do. Um, he is involved in creation. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters in regeneration. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And in Romans and Psalms, we can see descriptions of the Spirit that point to omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. So those, of course, are divine attributes. If the Spirit possesses those attributes, then the Spirit is divine. So that concludes the... Uh, the discussion of the person of the Holy Spirit, and the next will be the work of the Holy Spirit.